So we'll finally get to commercial insurance. We'll go pretty quickly through the products, um, do an overview of the products. The two special issues we want to cover for commercial insurance is what asbestos has done to this industry. It's a, been a huge issue. Some companies, this is a particularly large issue. In fact, Warren Buffett, the, whom we talked about earlier, he actually bought the liabilities of a company with a lot of asbestos exposure. Very, very interesting. And then professional liability, that was a huge issue uh, a couple of decades ago, very similar to the mold issue and the storm surge. It was just something that was causing great havoc to a, a particular part of the insurance world. It since has been somewhat addressed, although it is still, is still an issue. So we'll get into a couple of issues like that. Um, but the key is that you, you understand what the key products are and what you'll see is if, if you ever work with a company that has a, an insurance policy, you'll probably see all of, these, all of these coverages all in one package product, even though multiple insurance companies may be providing the coverage. So it's good to have a good idea of what is typically in these packaged insurance products and what they cover. So let's go to about page 37 of the notes. might be a slightly different page given some of the editing that I've done to the notes. But commercial insurance. A lot of commercial insurance, the biggest issue is negligence and torts. We'll talk a little about negligence and torts. I'd encourage you, if you took business law and you had some coverage of negligence, uh, it's been several years since I've had a course like that, so I took I took a course online from Audible, and I was amazed. Most of what I learned undergraduate still still applies. There was not a lot of new information. I took another course at USAA where they covered this material, and and it was very helpful. These are important things. If you're an expert, you'll have to learn this because this is going to tell you what that actual liability is. When do you have when do you have a coverage? When do you not have coverage? what types of risk are actually covered by the insurance. But don't forget your business law class. Negligence and torts is a big part of that, that class. And the negligence and torts is where you have liability where you had no contract. The liability just arises out of activities that you have. That's obviously important. We could have talked about that under homeowner's insurance. I've, I've waited to talk about it here under the commercial because it's very similar between the both. But when can you have a liability where you didn't sign up for anything? Just because of your activities uh, in public, when do you pick up a liability? So that's an important concept for insurance, especially it's an important concept to understand for yourself personally. So let's get into it. The first one is not that different than homeowner's insurance. Commercial property, there are different forms, the basic, broad, special forms, you know, all perils, uh, the special form is all perils unless excluded. It covers buildings and personal property. It also includes personal property of others if it's on an insured location. Now what's not covered, very similar to what we saw in, in homeowners. You see similar types of things. Um, the exclusions are very similar. There are some special cases obviously here. Um, Pollution is a special issue that's not covered. I remember at USAA pollution because they, you know, there's where they where they exist, especially with uh, in building La Cantera, right over the Edwards Aquifer. You know, pollution is a huge issue in San Antonio. Businesses, if they pollute the Edwards Aquifer, that could be a really serious, serious pollution issue. So that's that's a special type of issue. Um, pollution might fit better under liability, but it's often given as an exclusion under property. So the pollution damage to your own property. Um, the, the way the replacement value works with, with commercial is slightly different than with homeowners, but not materially so that it's, it's, you know, there's no reason to go through the formula. It has to do with how, how the deductible is actually applied, but very similar. So very, very similar to what we've seen before. We're talking about commercial property. We're not talking about products that are inventory types of things. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about inventory issues when we talk about theft. Now a huge one, business income loss coverage. This was a huge one in 2020 because with COVID-19 there was a lot of debate whether or not 
these policies covered lost business due to COVID-19. A lot of these products specifically excluded pandemics. And yet there were states saying, even with that exclusion, this you know, is so similar to what we saw with storm surge and with mold, uh, the COVID-19 actually raised one of those policy inter interpretation issues of, yet the policy seemed to clearly so show that business loss, income loss, revenue loss is not covered by these policies. A pandemic, when it's related to pandemic, these policies do not cover it, and yet some states were saying, we want this to be covered. I remember one group I work with, I called the, the head of that group and said, hey, have you talked to your insurance broker about COVID-19 and the potential impact and if we had business income loss coverage? He called our broker and the broker said, absolutely not, that's not covered. And then just a few days later, our broker called us back and said, well, send us what you have, we may be covering it. So that was an interesting one. Uh, it ended up not being an issue for us because we actually did better after COVID than we've been doing before. Our, actually, our income actually increased dramatically. And also you had the government program, the PPP program, and that provided a lot of protection. It's almost like the government PPP program wasn't business income loss coverage by the taxpayers. But it was a huge issue in 2020, and there are certainly companies like Delta or uh, movie theaters could certainly look at their policy and say, hey, do we have coverage? So what does it mean? It's specifically that some, some peril that the policy covers has occurred, and you didn't just lose property, you didn't just have property damage, you also lost customers because they could not come to your property. And so this insurance will say, okay, because of this peril, peril you lost uh, $8 million in revenue or income. We will reimburse you for that loss income. So reduction in income or increases in expenses are covered. Essentially what you're doing is you're looking at your net in income, what it would have been if the loss had not taken place. So sources of business income loss. So you have property damage. Or it could be a dependency on others. It depends on the policy. So, you know, you've, you you had property damage, a fire. So maybe you're a private school. You've had a fire. Your students can no longer come to your premises. Um, and so you don't have any, any income whatsoever. And so this policy will provide your income. Or you're, you've had a fire and now you have to go across the street and rent out uh, space and that rental space is going to cost you money so you still can hold your classes you can still collect income from your parents but you have to spend extra to rent either one of those so you have property damage and it caused you either to lose income or increase your expenses i know a private school i was working with there was a strip mall across the way and they just always assumed hey if we ever have a fire or something happens we'll just move over there well, at the time, the strip mall had a lot of empty space, but my question to the principal was, have you actually called that strip mall and asked how quickly could they set up and, and get you going? Rather than just assuming we can move our operations there, let's actually check. And then you're going to have to check every year because that particular strip mall actually saw a revival the last few years, and it's now pretty packed. So, you know, you have to ask those questions. That's good risk management. It could be a supplier, it could be one buyer, you know, it could be, there could be other areas where some peril causes a loss that you, you can no longer run your business. Some of these might be covered by a business loss income, it depends on the policy. Time is extremely important, so you're covered until you can get back up and operating. So if you lost some important piece of equipment, uh, you know, can you find replacement parts? How complex is the equipment? What are the building codes? Uh, I know in some businesses, they get some exceptions from the fire codes and other things, but if, if their building ever has a problem, they're going to have to rebuild under new codes. They're going to have to put new doors in and that kind of thing. We've, we've seen that with this private school where the fire marshal was trying to get us to put a whole new door in, which seemed absolutely ridiculous given how many other exits there were. That would have cost us several hundred thousand dollars. So the building codes can be extremely expensive. How long does it take you to produce your products? 
you know, some products you can't just produce them and have them out the door. So even though you're up back up and running, you may still have extra time that is you need the coverage. Uh, surrounding infrastructure, you know, maybe there's a widespread hurricane. So, and then how long is it? So how long does it take for you to get back to normal operations? And you may have to actually permanently lose some customers if you're doing a, a private school, um, or if you have a restaurant. You know, people. People go elsewhere and they, they stop eating your, 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 your business. So insurance can cover periods beyond the restoration period. I mean, it just depends on how the policy is written. There is generic language. So if you have this policy, your language probably looks exactly the same as all other businesses. This is one, where, one, one thing I love, and especially working with this private school, one thing I really love about the whole insurance brokerage process is I go through the policies I say, Okay, we're covered for this event, but let's think about it. What would happen if this happened? What would happen if this business we could not teach on our school premises anymore? And they say, well, we got this insurance policy that covers us. Yeah, that covers some of it, but what are we going to do? What is our process? So it's a good risk management process to actually go through simulations, go through scenarios of what would we actually do. And when they say, We'll just call over there and use that space over there. Then, well, let's call them now and see if that's even possible. And when in a year it happens, that can be important. Um, there's certain things that are definitely a loss that insurance doesn't cover. That's why COVID was such a big deal. What's covered and what's not covered. And that's another risk management technique. Don't assume everything's covered. So read the contract, look at those exclusions to say, wow, that exclusion, that could happen to us. That would be pretty material. This policy is not covering us. What would we do in that situation? So I think one of the worst risk management techniques people do is they assume insurance covers it. We've got an insurance policy for that, and that is really bad risk management. Um, so this is the coverage, extra expenses, expenses the avoid. Suspension of, the business, suspension of the business, expenses incurred to minimize, you know, repair, replace. So the policy gives you incentives to do whatever you can to get yourself back up and running. Some firms are moving more to like the life insurance approach, which is a value policy. Most, on the, most property and casualty policies are indemnity policies. So they look at your actual loss and they reimburse you based on that. But that can get really complicated, especially with the business income loss. So there are some moving toward a value policy where so they just say, if, if this is your loss, we pay you X. Kind of like with life insurance. If you die, we pay you $500,000. They don't sit down and try to calculate the value of your life depending on your, your training and what job you have. For life insurance, they say, hey, the policy is for $500,000, here's $500,000. And so you're seeing some of that in this type of policy where they just say, hey, if you have a business income loss, we pay you $50,000 a week um, or whatever. So it is simple. Um, it could create some moral, moral hazard or really morale hazard. I, I don't always get those the right way. Moral hazard, not that it's illegal, but it just doesn't encourage people to take good care of their business. The next policy, very specialized policy, commercial boiler and machinery. I don't know how the industry is set up now. This is an old quote, several years old, but at the time I did these notes, the top five writer, writers had over 70% of the business. So it's probably firms like Chubb and Hartford, very specialized. Uh, and because it, we're talking about very specialized machinery, Usually for insurance, they don't cover things like a machine breaks down. These are not maintenance insurance. But with these type of machinery, because when they break down, they can cause so much loss, so much damage, they're specifically covered even for, for breakdown. So it covers losses resulting from sudden accidental breakdown. And they're not covered on the commercial property insurance form except for perils covered by that farm. So if there's a fire or a hurricane, yeah, they're covered in there. But we're talking about uh, special machinery that has their own special risks that are not covered under the property. So this is like an addendum to your property coverage, but probably covered by a different insurance company. Um, so they require separate policy. I don't know what all this stuff is, but it's equipment that's subject to heat, 
pressure, electronic, electrical energy, centrifugal force, things like steam boilers and air takes, compressors, the vulcanizers, I'm not real sure what that is, furnacer, furnaces, kettles, I'm not sure the difference between some of these, I'm not sure what a mangle roll is, refrigerating, steam pipelines. Now, the private school I worked with, had this in their in their policy and so my question my first question to the people running the school is what is this covering what do we have that would be covered here obviously we had air conditioners so we had compressors and those kind of things but what exactly is is covered here and and that was my question to the insurance broker we have this policy we're paying for it list for me every piece of equipment that we have that would be covered by. So you see how the insurance process, again, helps you manage your business well. We, we talked about that in the first part of the class. Uh, you know, the capital asset pricing model says corporations, publicly traded companies shouldn't buy insurance, but one of the reasons they do is that the insurance process actually adds value to their business. And this is a good case here. It helps you sit down as a business and do good risk management. So here, operator error, operator error can be part of the problem. Faulty maintenance can be a problem. Faulty design. So there is a definite here, I got it correctly stated. It, there is a morale hazard here. If you know you're covered, then you may not do maintenance correctly. You may not train your employees correctly and just say, hey, we got insurance, why should we waste money? So what they do is you come down here is it has what they call loss control and you know, they, they essentially uh, require that the, the insured do certain things or the policy no longer is in, in place. So these policies really focus in on the, the insured taking care of the product, taking care of the, the, the piece of equipment. Um, so that brings in this idea of a suspension provision. And what that means is if the company is not following the maintenance, is not following all the requirements of the insurance company, they actually lose their coverage until they fix those problems. So you can see how this actually, so the insurance company actually comes in and forces, doesn't, in, doesn't encourage, doesn't help the firm do better loss control. They actually require the company to do better loss control, reducing frequency, reducing severity. So... Uh, so the company can view the insurance premium as really part of their risk control. The insurance companies come in and inspects, they have policies, they have training. The insurance company is specialized in this area. So you, you really, your premium, part of your premium is like a consulting fee. So interesting policy. So if you deal with any entity and you have this policy, you might ask them, ask your insurance broker, name, list for me every single piece of equipment this covers. If they can't list anything, then you got to ask, well, what are we paying for? This policy tends to be fairly exp inexpensive. It didn't cost us much in the private school, but we, did, we were paying money for it. All right, now I mentioned earlier on commercial property that we're not, we're not talking about stuff that you sell, your inventory. But a business that has inventory, like a Walmart, crime is a huge issue. HEB, Kroger's, obviously they, there's a lot of theft. And so they have a policy called commercial crime. So it protects against theft, disappearance, destruction by outsiders. Excludes destruction due to the perils covered by the commercial property, so fire and those kind of things. So we're talking about theft here, something that's illegal. It might, just like what we saw with the boiler, boiler and machine, it might require that the company have certain protective devices like alarms or bars. And if they don't keep that, they don't necessarily lose coverage, but the coverage is, is reduced. Now, dishonest act of employees, that's definitely not covered by commercial property. So it gives you, you know, you just realize you've got, when, when you're selling valuable stuff, so you've got a lot of valuable stuff in your building, commercial crime reflects that, you know, you have a special issue with theft, whether it's your employees or your customers. Um, so one interesting thing is the employee must be attempting to benefit from the act. So abusing quick equipment and drawing a normal check, you know, they can't just be an abusive employee. They've got to be trying to actually uh, uh, get some kind of benefit from it. It does not cover the 
inventory issues, shortages in the inventory. So uh, that's why you know I, I mentioned you know having videos up and those kind of things. You know you need to have some proof beyond just your inventory records. I don't know if any of y'all have ever done inventory. I'm not sure how inventory is done now. Obviously, um, with robotics, that's radically changing. And with robotics, almost every day, and more more technology, they there this this might be changing. A firm might be able to more easily prove theft than they have in the past. Uh, once a dishonest employee has been discovered, any future acts for that employee are not covered. Obviously, the employee should be fired and, and excluded from access to the building. Uh, forgery or alteration is covered. Extortion. Uh, this is pretty interesting. You know, ransom paid for the release of the insurer. This is a big issue in certain countries. Um, the policy seems a little bit hard nosed. It says the threat must be to do bodily harm. They can't just say, "Hey, we're going to kill a, an old famous tree and, and that that you have if you don't if you don't do this." So it has to be bodily harm. Um, it must be reported to the authorities, even if the people kidnapping says, "Don't do that." So there's certain specific rules there. Computer fraud coverage, obviously. Um, Cybersecurity is a huge issue. You could write your entire paper too. I've had a few students talk about cybersecurity and insurance. So um, a lot of this is not covered by commercial crime, and cybersecurity has become a huge issue. So um, so don't assume you have coverage for that in this policy. And then money and security, just like we saw with homeowners, um, they want you to put that stuff in the bank in safe places so there's going to just be minimal coverage there so here's something very different between homeowners and the commercial side is crime is specifically taken out in homeowners theft is part of your homeowners policy but with on the business side crime is is a specifically different different policy now commercial inland marine this also applies to you as an individual but i put it under the commercial side because it's part of that package policy that most people get on the commercial insurance. So this is transfer, transportation insurance, also known as cargo insurance. It's called inland marine, which seems strange to me. Uh, marine, you know, you think ocean, people uh, sending cargo over the seas. That's the oldest form of insurance that we know of. Um, inland marine is, is not just on waters, but it's it can be by truck or plane or, or train. So it's cargo insurance. It covers shipments primarily by land or air. It's unique, so there's not really standard policies here, although there are standard policies under the package policy. It's closest thing to all risk coverage that you can get in commercial. So the key is though is who bears the risk. So who owns the cargo while it's being trans transported? That's extremely important to understand. If you're you're frequently ordering supplies for someone else and it's in the truck on the way to your store do you own that or does the people shipping it to you so if it's FOB point of origin title passes from the seller to the buyer when the goods are accepted by the carrier so that means you that are receiving you you bear all the risk while it's in transportation FOB destination the title passes when the goods are delivered so that would be important to know. So if you're constantly having stuff delivered to you, you need to know who has ownership. The terms of the sale, one party may agree to be liable. So even if it's, you know, if it says this, the, the, the contract between the buyer and seller, seller, remember what I, you know, it's, we, we talked earlier that contracts, or maybe this was in my real estate management class, but contracts are what cause uh, it, one of the main reasons for a contract is to shift liability between the parties. So you can't have a contract between buyer and seller where they specifically say who's responsible. Um, you could just say, well, what about the carriers? So FedEx, um, Amazon Prime, UPS, why don't I just sue them if something goes wrong? Well, they have a lot of restrictions that you may not like. And they may not have the wherewithal to actually cover you. So you may need additional coverage. Um, you can do it as an annual policy that just covers everything. You can do it specific to a trip. Um, 
and the mail the the postal service has this as well now i've had stuff mailed to me by fedex ups that has been damaged i remember i purchased the scores to all the symphonies of gustav Mahler, one big box and the, the person delivers to my house on a very cloudy day that was going to rain and he puts it right underneath the eve it wasn't raining when he got there but when i got home it was pouring down rain and he put it exactly where the rain came down and it just they were soaked so i let the person that i bought the books from know they said not our problem they let fedex know uh fedex took the entire risk i think it could have been ups but i, I think it was fedex they took the entire risk they sent me an, an entire new shipment and the books that got damaged i even told them you know they're so usable they're just the paper pages are all crinkled like i probably even sent them a picture so they weren't disaster they weren't destroyed they were just they just looked bad uh, and so they sent me another set i still have the old set that's all crink crinkled because i use those to, to play from so i don't mess up the, the nice set so i ended up it actually a big benefit to me I didn't ask them to do that, but they, they did. They did reshift. I was even saying I'd be willing to pay for some of that, but I just didn't pay for all of it. But they just sent it all. So somehow the courier carriers do take responsibility. In that case, it was their fault. Um, and I had evidence. I could show it. So um, now as far as the mail service, um, when, you, when you ship something from the postal service, they'll ask you there if you want insurance on that. And... Uh, you know, I've never had a claim there. I did ship one fairly expensive thing. I think that this was FedEx where they actually asked about the insurance. And so I did buy the insurance and it was like $100 for the insurance. But it was, this was a very large frame glass photo picture, a painting or uh, a reprint. And boy, the, the person who wrapped it up, boy, um, he... He made it so, actually, I called the people that I mailed this to, and they, they almost couldn't open it up again. He wrapped it so well. He got there unharmed. Uh, so, you know, you can get, that's that specific trip insurance. It can be expensive. They're going to ask you what's there, how much does it cost, what's it going to cost to replace it. it. It can be expensive, but if you're worried about it, you know, this was something that was worth maybe $800, and it cost me $90 to insure the ship it because it was so big and bulky and fragile all at the same time. Now, I do remember in the U.S. Postal Service, I was behind this guy who was insuring something. He was talking about how fragile it was and that he wanted insurance. And I kid you not, the postal worker sold him the insurance, put everything down, and he turned around and tossed that box into a bin. And he tossed it a good six, seven feet and the guy in front of me was just horrified. He just talked about how fragile this was. I mean, it was the most, I wish I had a video of that. It was just, I would have been, I would have been lividly mad. I would have opened the box immediately to make sure he didn't just break it. It was really ridiculous. All right, so now we get into the big issue, commercial liability. So we'll have to talk a little bit about this. Um, so... Criminal liability insurance does not apply. Contract liability insurance does not apply. That's the whole reason you have the contract, so that you don't need insurance. You know who's liable. It's possible the contract will make you liable. Maybe you will have some insurance coverage, but generally, contract law is separate. So when we're talking about liability, we're talking about tort. The word tort just means a wrong done by one person to another person. I like, the, I like the word negligence. We're going to talk here about unintentional negligence. There's unintentional, there's intentional, and then there's strict liability. Strict liability, we'll cover that more when we talk about workers' comp. But negligence, especially unintentional, insurance covers it. There's gross negligence where you're just, it's just almost criminal. And the key here is you're part of society and so you have a duty of care where, where you should have done something because you're a member of society you didn't do it and there was a loss and that's the key here we're not saying hey you had a duty of care and you didn't do it so I'm gonna sue you if there's no loss they can't sue you there has to be some loss I watched Judge Judy some I don't 
like Judge Judy that much. Her program is like she's she's a little bit mean in my opinion. She, the way she jumps on people, I think it's part of the show and part of just kind of the humor of the program, where she's in, intentionally just hard nosed and, and almost almost um, almost just screams at people. Uh, but a lot of times on that program, people come and it's you know it's I want to sue them for harassment. They harass me. Well, what loss did you have? hurt feelings. I'm not going to give you money because your feelings were hurt. Um, so there needs to be a loss. Intentional, you can get insurance for intentional, libel, slander, false imprisonment. Those are all possible. As long as they weren't criminal, those are all possible. And then strict liability. We'll talk about that. That's liability even if you weren't at fault. So we'll talk through that. So again, you must have damages to have a claim. So Here's the way the law works, and hopefully you remember this from your business law class. So when does negligence arise? So negligence arises when we owed a duty of care to another person. The plaintiff was owed that duty of care from the defendant. There was a dereliction of that, or a breach, a breach of that duty. The defendant strictly caused an injury, so there's damage, and it was directly caused by the defendant. The defendant's actions were the approximate cause of the damage. There couldn't have been too many, too many other things inter intervening. And then a judge or jury will decide. Now, on the personal side, the most frequent one I see on the on the TV court shows. Frequently, it's, it's dogs. More than anything else, it's dogs. I don't think I've ever seen one related to cats. But it's a dog bite. I've seen several where it's one dog attacking another dog. And in Judge Judy and Millian, I like Millian's program a lot better. Um, she, she sticks to what I learned in business law a whole lot better than Judge Judy. Judge Judy tends to be whom she believes and whom she doesn't believe. It's all about Judge Judy's ability to... Um, figure out who's telling the truth. Like she's got this sixth sense of truth tellers. Millian follows what I learned in business law much more closely. Um, and so the key there is, did you breach your duty of care? So if your dog was running around outside of your yard, uh, you had a duty of care. You might say, well, the dog got out. I didn't know about it. Well, you still have a duty of care to make sure your dog is, is not running loose. Now, if your neighbor comes to your house and opens your front door and your dog runs out and then kills your neighbor's dog, well, you say, hey, they shouldn't open my door without knocking. You know, So that's what a judge and jury are trying to figure out is what is that duty of care? It's, it's the prudent person rule. It's what is reasonable to expect of another human being, and that's, that's what you're up against. Now, when we get to unintentional torts versus intentional torts, intentional torts, Defamation of character, we'll talk about a couple of these. Libel is written, slander is spoken, and so you must have some damages. We'll look at a couple, of, or at least one famous case of this. Uh, we've seen with some of that in the UK. Now, in the UK, the rules are much different there. In the UK, um, if you just talk badly about someone, you can have a lawsuit, even if what you say about them is true. In the US, truth is usually your defense. Unless you had some confidentiality agreement with them, speaking the truth is your defense. As long as what you say, you can prove what you said is true, then it's not liable, it's not slander. But that's not true in every country. So if you visit the UK, be careful. Trespass, again, there must be damages. So just because you put posted no trespassing and someone comes on your property, the only thing you can do is you can call the police and tell them that they've been trespassed and they must get off the property they're not committing a crime unless they refuse to get off the property. But as far as a civil lawsuit, as far as you suing them, you have to show that they did damage to your property. Conversion, a really nice way to talk about theft. Obviously, theft is a crime, so if you actually commit theft. But it's possible that you have conversion where you weren't actually stealing. You thought it was yours, and you took it, and you didn't have a permission. You know, Or maybe you were borrowing it and just didn't do it in a good way, and you caused damage. That's conversion. You take someone else's property without their permission. Assault and battery. Assault is a threat. Battery is the actual physical harm, although I think a lot of people use the word assault for, for the physical harm. Um, again, assault, that threat, 
you know, pain and suffering, mental anguish, those are losses that you can sue for. But generally courts, you know, if it's just a little bit of stress, they're probably not going to give you anything. Battery, physical harm. I have seen several Judge Judy cases related to physical harm, and she will always ask for the medical records. I, I saw a case just the other day. The lady said that she was assaulted and batter it had battery from her ex-husband. Judge Judy says, well, show me the medical bills. She, she gave the medical bills, and the medical bills were from four or five days later. And so Judge Judy was all over her. Why, why didn't you go immediately? If you're, if you're really harmed, why didn't you go immediately to the doctor? Where, where's the photos of your damages? Those kind of things. And it's not that battery's not covered, but Judge Judy want to say, hey, I, I want to make sure you actually had damages. And in false imprisonment, um, you know, kidnapping would actually be obviously a criminal event, but false imprisonment. I've seen some stores have gotten in trouble where they will retain someone because they think they stole. That can be false imprisonment if they held that person against their will, if it can cause damages. Maybe they miss going to work or they lost their job or whatever. Uh, their time is valuable, so I've seen Judge Judy have a claim on something similar to this, not false imprisonment, but one of these things. And she said, I, I agree, the plaintiff was harmed, and she would give the plaintiff $10. And because she just didn't think it was that big of a deal, but she did. She said, yeah, you did have harm, and here's what you get. The damages themselves can be compensatory. There's also punitive damages. So compensatory, are special. there's two types. There's special damages, which this is where you had an actual moment monetary loss. You had medical bills. You lost property. Something was damaged. You had to re get it replaced. And then there's general damages, and that's pain and suffering. We talked about pain and suffering. We talked about the uninsured motorists under auto insurance. The uninsured motorists, in my opinion, that's the main thing it's covering is pain and suffering. And so, yeah, if someone does you wrong, you can sue them for pain and suffering. So you, those are damages. Even though you may not have any medical bills, you just had so much anguish, the courts will give you some money for that. And then when you have really gross negligence, someone's done something to you and the courts say, you know what, that was so egregious, we don't want anyone else to do that, so we're going to give punitive damages. So it's damages to make an example of the defendant to try to encourage them and others not to do that in the, in the future. Most articles on tort reform talk about the excessive nature of punitive damages. We're going to talk about that here because there's some famous cases I'm going to give you two in particular. One is a McDonald's hot coffee, which you probably have heard a lot about. The BMW paint job case, you probably have not heard as much about. Um, that one, I've, I've had some debate whether or not that was a legitimate case or not. But let's talk about McDonald's. Anytime you hear the example case of punitive damages getting out of hand, you almost always hear a McDonald's hot coffee case come up. Some of you have probably heard this and know it's not a frivolous case at all. I don't think it's a frivolous case at all. But this lady, Linebeck, sued McDonald's because the way you hear it, she poured coffee, she poured coffee on herself and she sued for punitive damages. So it sounds like, okay, a poor, poor person poured some coffee on themselves, you know, you have a little bit of pain and you, you have some clothes that might have been harmed. You know, it's a, you know, it's a few dollars. It's not that big of a deal. Well, let's look at this case. So the jury awarded $160,000 in compensatory damages and $2.7 million in punitive damages. So you say, that's ridiculous. Well, let's look at this. This is what most people don't tell you. First of all, she suffered third degree burns on her, on her lap. The judge, the trial judge reduced the verdict, so she didn't get the $2.7 million. They, they settled out of court, so who knows what they, they got. But this is also referred to as a frivolous lawsuit. ABC News calls the case the poster child for excessive lawsuits. Uh, LA Times stated that the claims was a meaningful and worthy lawsuit. So what is it? They argue McDonald's coffee was defective. All right, so part of this is there is some shared responsibility. They're going to say, yeah, this lady, a grandmother, she's partly at fault. Now, I think some people talk about this, that she was driving with hot coffee, and that was part of the problem. You can't drive with hot coffee. That's kind of, 
but she wasn't. She was in the passenger seat. She wasn't driving. The lid on the coffee was, was defective, so there was problems with the lid. But their main claim was the coffee was too hot. No one would expect to spill coffee on their lap and suffer third degree burns. So that's part of it. Is that even reasonable? McDonald's had already settled other lawsuits. So this wasn't the first time this happened. This wasn't just some person they poured some coffee on them and boy, McDonald's, you know, it's a minor thing. McDonald's had had other serious lawsuits. And McDonald's refused to offer more than $800. She had over $10,000 in medical bills, and McDonald's says, we'll give you $800. They thought it was a meritless uh, lawsuit. They say she spilled the coffee on herself. She's ex fault. She's the one that was careless. So, again, I get back to what do you reasonably expect? What is your social responsibility? Do you have a responsibility when your product spills on a customer and you know it's going to cause serious burns such that she actually had to have skin grafts. All right? I mean, that's something that you don't hear. She had to do skin grafts. This is a grandmother, too. We're talking about someone who is not going to recover quickly from this. So she ordered a 49 cent cup of coffee through the drive through window. She was a passenger. Um, her grandson parked a car so she could add some cream. So even they were, you know, this wasn't like he slammed on the gas the gas pedal and you know like you know this this was a grandson looked like he was acting responsibly she was wearing sweatpants so that made it absorb the coffee even more held it against her skin it scalded her um, she was taken to the hospital she had 30 green burns on six percent of her skin man that's and then or six serious and six percent and other burns on 16 percent she was in the hospital for eight days undergoing skin grafts. She lost 20 pounds during that time. She was down to 83 pounds. That is almost nothing. And she had two years of medical treatment afterwards. So those that say this was, you know, frivolous, don't talk to the fact this lady was tremendously harmed by this. They discovered McDonald's required franchises to serve the coffee at 180, 190 degrees. They knew McDonald's. He had proof that they knew McDonald's, that McDonald's knew their coffee could cause this type of burn. My documents from McDonald's show that from 82 through 92, they have received more than 700 reports of people being seriously burned by the coffee. And they had settled claims for more than $500,000. So they're offering this lady $800, even though they had had $500,000 claims in the past when this lady had spent over $10,000 and had suffered skin grafts. They testified that the number of injuries was insufficient to cause the com company to change its practices. They argued that all foods hotter, hotter than 130 de degrees constitute a burn hazard and that restaurants had more pressing dangers to warn about. This sounds a lot like the Ford Pinto knowing that their car blew up on impact with rear collisions and they decided, you know, it's not worth us to fix it. It's cheaper to pay the lawsuits than it is to fix the car. Very similar type of case. The jury reached its verdict applying the principle of comparative negligence. So they're saying, yeah, McDonald's was 80% responsible, the defendant was 20%. Now in the past, if there was comparative negligence in the past, courts would say the plaintiff gets nothing. They, they get no coverage whatsoever. But Courts today, they, they, they assign comparative negligence. McDonald's was 80%. This lady was 20% at fault. And so they look at the total losses, and then McDonald's is responsible for 80% of that. There was a warning on the coffee cup, but the jury decided the warning was neither large enough nor sufficient. So they gave her $250,000 in comp compensatory damages. So essentially what they're saying, okay, $10,000 is for... Your medical bills but another hundred and ninety thousand dollars is for your pain and suffering that was reduced by 20 percent because she was 20 percent at fault and then they put two point million for punitive damages now how many tens of thousands of dollars did mcdonald's spend just defending itself paying its lawyers so what if they had paid her what she initially had asked for 
they probably would have saved money. The jurors apparently arrived at this figure from the suggestion that McDonald's uh, one or two days of coffee revenues would be sufficient to uh, to get them to think more carefully about this. The decision was appealed by both McDonald's and the grandmother, but the party settled out of court for an unexclusive amount less than six hundred thousand dollars. I don't think this is frivolous. McDonald's has a product; they know the product can cause damage. It has caused damage many times in the past. This lady went through a lot of pain and suffering. So if you hear the McDonald's come up, man, I still hear it today, the McDonald's coffee. McDonald's coffee. I see it here on late night television. Yeah, the McDonald's coffee lawsuit. It's still given. This poor lady has become the poster child for something that, boy, she, she covered. I'm sure she's probably still not alive. But, yeah, the poor, poor lady had this lawsuit and became a, a laughing stock on late night television. Um... Now, let's look at the second one. This one, I think, is closer to a frivolous lawsuit, but I've had some students say, no, this was not frivolous. This doctor bought a BMW, bought it brand new. He later discovered that the vehicle had been repainted before he bought it. It had, had suffered minor damage on shipment, and BMW's policy was if there's minor damage getting the car to the lot, if it's less than 3% of the cost of the car, we'll fix that without telling anyone that the car has been damaged. And so Gore, what Gore said is, well, there was some damage to the car, and so when I try to resell this car, I'm going to suffer a loss. So the jury awarded him $4,000 in compensatory damage, and they awarded him $4 million in punitive damage. That was later re reduced to $2 million. So the court says they found that it's, it excessively high punitive damages in this case violated the due process, for punitive damages to stand, the damages must be reasonably necessary to vindicate the state's legitimate interest in punishment and deterrence. Punitive damages may not be grossly excessive. And so, on, on appeal, they, they, they said, okay, the, the damages were too high. So they had three factors in making this determination. The degree of re re reprehensibility, the ratio of compensatory damages... So how much actual damages have versus the punitive damages. The punitive damage award and civil or criminal penalties that could be imposed for comparable misconduct. So the, the court's kind of saying, you know, what, what makes sense here? What's reasonable? The court found that BMW's contact was, was not particularly reprehensible. It wasn't reckless to regard, especially for health and safety. This guy was not at risk. It wasn't like they fixed the car in a way that, you know, he could die in an accident. There was no evidence of bad faith. The ratio of actual or potential damages to punitive damages seems suspiciously high. The criminal sanctions available were limited to $2,000, so making a $2 million assessment equivalent to a severe criminal penalty. The court noted, however, that these three factors can be overridden if it's necessary to deter future contact, conduct. The Supreme Court ordered a new trial unless the plaintiff accepted a all but $50,000 in punitive damages award. The court reasoned that it may not had given sufficient weight to the degree of reprehensibility of BMW's contact and selected $50,000 out of a range. So $50,000 seems reasonable to me. Uh, I would have been happy with that. They repainted my car. He never noticed it. I don't know how he discovered this later and how he knew he had damages. So it's, it's kind of interesting to me. Uh, I, that part of the case, I, I don't know the detail on. Four million does seem excessive to me. A few million dollars to me did not seem excessive on the McDonald's side, given McDonald's history. Some students have argued this is a big deal. When people buy these luxury cars, they need to be pristine, perfect, and if they're not, they need to know. That's a big deal. If a car has been repaired, has been in the repair shop before the person bought it, it doesn't matter if it's 3% of the cost of the car or 1% of the cost of the car. If it's been in the repair shop, the, the dealer has a responsibility to tell the buyer that. And that might mean they have to give a discount, and that's fine. You know, if they got to take $1,000 off the cost of the car to sell it. The, the, the buyer has a right to know that. So I, I can see that argument and that this is something serious that, this, that these auto manufacturers do. So it's up to you. You can decide... 
to me, the most frivolous lawsuit, and you can look it up, it's the lawyer who sued about pants. And you can, you can certainly look that one up. I mean, here's the actual case itself. Judge rules in favor of the dry cleaners in 54 million pants lawsuit. Um, they were sued for $54 million. Why? Because, and this is a lawyer, he was suing them. But the lawyer went to get his pants, and he got the pants he got back. He says, those are not my pants. And so he sued the laundromat. His, his lawsuit was, cr I, I think, absolutely crazy. He, this lawyer actually got into a lot of trouble for bringing this lawsuit. But the laundromat had a sign out in front that said, Satisfaction Guaranteed. And because of that, he sued multiple times for every single place they had to sign up and for every day because there was, there was a law that said, you, you know, this kind of false advertisement, you could, you could bring this kind of court. And so he just multiplied it, number of signs, number of days, and it got up to several million dollars. Um, just crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, what the thing that was really intense about this court case is the incredible damage this lawsuit brought to the laundromat and it, it almost it put this poor couple out of business because of all the legal costs that they had so I, I encourage you to read this case it's to me this is this is the poster child it's not McDonald's coffee it's this guy right here who is who is the poster child for a frivolous lawsuit uh, 54 million dollars just because he didn't get his pair of pants back and now he wasn't necessarily doing you know pain and suffering or punitive damage he was specifically talking about the sign that they put up where they said satisfaction is guaranteed he wasn't satisfied it was guaranteed and that nothing they did would, was going to guarantee him and so he was suing them for that don't be like that in your life All right, so if you're sued for, for negligence, what are your defense? First is consent, that you know, you, the person that you're dealing with, they knew what was going on, they had expressed or implied consent. Contributing negligence in the U.S. It, it doesn't, it's not a complete defense, except for in some cases. There is the last clear chance, so the plaintiff had an opportunity to prevent the loss, but chose not to. If the plaintiff can show that his negligence had been spent and the defendant still had a chance, you know, so it goes back and forth. Again, this is just reasonability. It's just common sense. If it's illegal, if the activity is illegal, then that's, that's a defense. Um, you know, you can't sue for negligence because you, someone's cocaine uh, product was, was somehow defective, although that would not fall under negligence. That would be product uh on our product side, but still, you know, it was illegal, what was going on was illegal. It was, if it was intentional, um, so if it's intentional, your defense in the U.S., your defense is, it is the truth. Unless there is some contractual relationship, if it's contractual, then that goes under contract law, not, a, not under negligence. So you can sue someone for giving out private information, even if it's true, if you had a contractual relationship there. Or you can prove that you were not negligent. So the prudent person rule, you, if you act in a way that was customary. Now we've seen some cases like this. Like someone's drowning in a pool and you did nothing to try to rescue them. So the question is going to come back, what should a prudent person have done? It's not the same as the prudent expert rule. So if you're not a doctor, you're not required to, uh, you know, uh, give the person a tracheometry or whatever, something to, to save this person from death if you're not a doctor, if you're not an expert. If you're an expert, the rules change, and there's that's when we'll talk next about professional liability. It's, it's a different type of rule, but the, the prudent person rule. Now, one thing I say is not a defense is you have them sign a liability waiver. I see these all the time, these liability waivers. We use it. And some of the activities I do with students when we travel, in my opinion, they have no power whatsoever except the consent side. When you have someone sign a library waiver, waiver, you're at least giving them 
knowledge that they accepted the risk. They knew it was risky, and they went, they accepted the risk. So when something happened, you say, hey, it's not negligence, that's just part of this activity. I've even seen a waiver of liability of gross negligence. And I just, that to me is absolutely ridiculous. I walked into a gym once, I wanted to tour their gym, I was thinking about signing up. They had me sign a waiver of liability for gross negligence. How ridiculous is that? I signed it, but when I signed that, I said, Ronald Sweet, except for uh, negligence. I, I, I don't excuse them for any negligence. If their employees are negligent, I'm suing them, especially gross negligence. I had a, um, I, I bought ski lessons for a youth minister I, was, I took on a trip. He and his wife went on a trip. They'd never skied before, and I thought, hey, you're working with youth. You better learn how to ski. I'll buy you lessons. They had me sign a waiver of gross negligence. And I, I sign, and even signing, I'm thinking, there's, there's no legal, so, so think about it. You sign up for ski lessons, you've never skied before in your life, and they say, you've got you've to gotta waive liability for us, even for gross negligence. You sign that, and then the ski instructor takes a beginner up to a double black slope their very first day and pushes them down the hill, and they break every bone in their body, and they say, hey, we were negligent, we were grossly negligent, but you signed the waiver. You can still sue them. Signing that waiver has no legal protection for them other than they have some proof that you knew what you were doing was risky. But as a beginner skier, you don't expect someone to take you to a double black hill and push you down your very first day. You're like, wait, am I supposed to be doing this? Should I be here? And they say, yeah, 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 everything's fine. You can still sue. Um, so waiver of liabilities, I, I, I really believe, you know, read it. And if it says you're excusing yourself from gross negligence, I would even write it down at the bottom. My knowledge of law is it is not, there is no legal ramifications of a waiver of liability for negligence, and especially not for gross negligence. So, you know, just think about what you're signing up to. So, all right. So there's negligence. Um, what about negligence related to someone who does have special skills, professional liabilities. So we'll talk about that next time and then we'll get into the asbestos case and some other issues.